30% of the animals that go into the factory, 30% of the reactors will be lesioned. That's not to say that the other 70% are not infected. It's just that the lesions are microscopic. So you don't, you know, you can't see them with the naked eye. And particularly then if you're using the GIF test, you actually pull that back to about 15% of the animals will show lesions. So it's about the stage of the infection that you're picking up in. The more advanced the infection, the more lesions that you'll see. The earlier in the infection you take the animal out, the less likely you are to see uh, lesions there. Hello, I'm James Dunn, and you're welcome to The Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights, and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. This week, we have a joint episode with The Beef Edge, so I'm delighted to be joined by host Catherine Egan, Chagas Beef Specialist, and David Quinn, Superintendent Veterinary Inspector at the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine, to dispel some of the myths around TB, bovine tuberculosis. And I first asked Davis to give an overview of the current TB stats around the country. If we were to look at the 12-month period going back to last April, uh, April 2023, we've had about 30,000 reactors. Now, that's um, that's about 6,000 up if you were to look at the the the, the uh, period preceding that uh, back to April 2022, where we had about 24,000 reactors. And unfortunately, the herd incidence it has crept up as well. It's been kind of slowly creeping up there the last two years. And we're at about 5% now of the total number of herds in the country restricted. So unfortunately, at the moment, the, the statistics are going in, in the wrong direction. Um, we've had an increased focus on the detection of the disease. And we felt that maybe the disease levels, we were looking at factory lesions and things like that. So we felt that maybe disease levels had been rising in the background. And one of those in relation to cattle is that you have to have uh, bovine TB eradication our control program in place. So, you know, while I say like sometimes this is perceived as something that's, you know, a burden, the reality is that if you didn't have this, we would lose the access to all those markets that we have. And farmers, David, are well aware of the TB eradication scheme and the annual herd tests. Can you just talk through what's actually happening when the herd test is actually be carried out to each of the animals? Yeah, so what we use is the, uh, the skin test and it's a comparative test. So basically what you do is you clip the neck of the cattle on two different sites. You inject in the top, you're injecting a, a, a little drop of avian tuberculin, and in the bottom, you're injecting bovine tuberculin. <laughs> and you come back 72 hours later. And what's happened in that interim period in the 72 hours is that you get an immune response to those tuberculins that you've injected into those sites. And you measure then the increases. So you're what you're doing is you're kind of stimulating the animal's immune system. So you get in, in an animal that's infected, you'll get an increase at the avian site and you get an increase at the bovine site. So you measure those. And if the uh, measurement between them is greater than four, if the bovine measurement is greater than four or four and greater, four millimeters and greater, then that's what we deem to be a standard reactor. And if that positive animal shows up as a reactor, what are the chances of that not being TB? So you're getting into the sensitivity and specificity of the test there. So I might just talk a little about the sensitivity because that's um, that's in terms of picking up your true positives. So th- the sensitivity of the test is about 80%. So it's a very good test in terms of a, a herd screening test, but it does m- miss individual animals. So, I mean, the benefits of the test is that it's easy to do. You're not involved in complicated laboratory procedures and you have a fairly quick turnaround time on it. So, you know, it does have benefits, but the, the one that... Um, the drawbacks is that the sensitivity of the test is not 100%. We we estimate maybe about one in 5,000 animals could be at what we call a false positive. In terms of David, you mentioned there false positives. And, and we hear a lot, of, and obviously there's frustration uh, at farmer level with regards to that. But maybe speak to me a little bit about the false negative. And is that a bigger issue than 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 the false positive? The bacteria itself is uh, Mycobacterium bovis, and it's it's an unusual bacteria, and there's certain peculiarities about it that it can it can basically affect an animal and remain latent um, if the animal's immune system is in any way compromised. Um, you don't you, you they can go undetected by the test, and also they can enter what they call like the pre-allergic phase. So, 
we reckon it's about three to six weeks after an animal becomes infected, their immune response will not be adequate enough to respond to the test. Even though the animal is infected, you won't pick it up in that early stage. So you have different things happening that kind of frustrate the test, um, you know, around calving, let's say, both in beef and dairy animals, the, you know, the animal has gone through a big change in terms of hormones. It's having to calve, it's stressful. Sometimes they're being introduced into other, you know, new groups of animals and they're having to produce milk as well. So all of that is physiological stress and that can reduce the immune response. So, you know, these are the type of animals that you don't pick up on the test then. And then obviously if you miss those animals and they're left behind in the herd, you know, that's that's the risk then is that they spread and that they're shedding embovis into the environment and it's been picked up by other animals then. Yeah, and, and maybe that's where I was coming with regards to the, the role of the blood test then in terms of where, where you have identified a, a breakdown in a herd. It, just to explain to our listeners, how does the blood test then work um, over and above the skin test? Yeah, so we have uh, a blood test which is called the gamma interferon test. Uh, I, I believe it was developed in New Zealand. Um, now, the, it, it's a good test, but like all tests, it has uh, positives and it has negatives. So basically what the test does is that um, you're looking for this cytokine, which is basically an immunological hormone uh, or a messenger protein that's in the blood. It's produced by white blood cells in infected animals. So that's that's what you're actually looking for. So you, you take your blood sample, you send the blood sample to the lab and at the lab then they will try and stimulate those blood samples with both avian and uh, bovine tuberculins and a, a little like the skin test there um you know you're measuring the difference then so wh when they're exposed to the or stimulated by these tuberculins you get uh, increases in the gamma interferon and then you measure those increases and uh, it's a comparison test as, as, again but the, the, the difficulty with the test is while it's very good at picking out true positives it does tend to pick out a lot of false positives. The difficulty where you do have a breakdown in a herd, nobody, no farmer wants to lose animals. The concern around that, but is best practice there going in and finding the possibility of that non-responsive animals? We see that a little bit where there's a reluctance there maybe. Look, I suppose you have to look, there's, there's different types of herd breakdowns. You know, you get singletons, which is a single animal, or you might get two reactors and... The issue is when you get into kind of three or more or depending on the size of the herd, you know, if you put 10 percent of the herd infected, um, it's important to get in there because sometimes what you're picking up on the skin test is the tip of the iceberg. And the longer this remains in your herd, the harder it could be to root it out. So, you know, you're if you're continually failing the skin test, you're getting into things like herd depopulation. So, you know, sometimes, as you say, the farmers could be reluctant because they're afraid of you know extra animals being removed but it's it's if you get in early and can try and take out you know infected animals and pick them up the skin tests or the the gamma interferon test will actually pick them up at an earlier stage in the infection than uh, the skin test so it's important to get those animals out or otherwise you can wind up in this kind of recurring cycle of test after test after test which is the most most frustrating thing from a, from a farmer perspective, where you see herds locked up for a, for a period. Yeah. And maybe just talk through that, David, like the follow-on test that you're mentioning there. Why is the follow-up test needed 60 days after? Why is it 60 days? And why are two clear tests needed? So I think when you asked me uh, initially um, about the, the skin test, and I spoke about how you are kind of stimulating the immune system. So when you inject the tuberculin into the two clip sites, you're looking for an immune response. So you're, you're, you're turning on the uh, the immune system to those specific tuberculins. The, the difficulty is if, if you go in too quickly afterwards, you'll desensitize the animal. Uh, so really what you need to do is you, you need to allow a period to lapse where the immune system effectively turns itself off to that tuberculin, and then you can come back in at the 60 days. So that's the, that's the thinking behind uh, that lapse period there. And then uh, the reason for the two tests so you have to get the two clear tests, as I spoke there about that pre-allergic stage. So if you have an infection circulating in the herd, uh, you're not going to pick up those early infected animals. So you need to allow that time to lapse where they will actually be detected on the test. And I suppose probably an important point to make about the two clear tests is it, it can be, you know, people can fall into the trap of thinking I have two clear tests, so I'm free of TB. Really, what you've got is you've got two clear tests. So you've satisfied the criteria to have your herd de-restricted. 
but you're not necessarily free of TB. There could be animals that have been missed by the test. So that's why in the three years after your two clear tests, you're at a higher risk of breaking down than if you go beyond that uh, three year period. And I suppose the other way really, David, that TB is detected is when cattle are brought to the factory. And in some cases, if lesions show up then, and also from the point where you mentioned there where depopulation happens and maybe there are no lesions when those cattle are brought to the factory. Can you just talk through that? Yeah, and I suppose look, even during my time in practice, you know, that would have been a common complaint uh, amongst farmers that uh, my, my cattle went to the factory and there was no lesions. And I, I mentioned earlier about how we see very few clinical cases or, you know, most people will never see a clinical case anymore because of the screening test and because you're picking them up uh, at an earlier stage in the infection. So because of that, you tend not to see lesions in a lot of the animals. So about 30% of the animals that go into the factory, 30% of the reactors will be lesioned. Um, that's not to say that the other 70% are not infected. It's just that the lesions are microscopic. So you don't, you, you know, you can't see them with the naked eye. And particularly then if you're using the GIF test, you actually pull that back to about 15% of the animals will show lesions. So it's about the stage of the infection that you're picking up in. The more advanced the infection, the more lesions that you'll see. And the earlier you take the animal out or the the earlier in the infection you take the animal out, the less likely you are to see uh, lesions there. Um, There's actually, we have a website called www.bovinetv.ie and there's really, really good YouTube videos on that. And they've they've good headings, you know, it's very simply explained, things like why did my animals not have lesions? Um, other things about the TB test. So if any of your listeners are interested in kind of hearing more about that, because there's only so much that we can cover here today, uh, that's a very good website to go on. Just because they don't show lesions doesn't mean that they don't have TB. Yeah, it comes back to that, to, to the false positive and the specificity of the skin test. Like the skin test is, as I say, it's a very good screening test. The chances of picking up or, or taking out an animal that's not truly infected is really, really low. It's one in 5,000. So you know, if if your animal is positive on the skin test, it's highly, highly likely that it's a reactor, despite not having lesions. Maybe to come on to the, and I'm sure there'll be some listeners that unfortunately are suffering from this, but these herds with prolonged outbreaks or um, a number of reactors maybe go, go clear for a short period, Davis, and um, maybe have a breakdown again. What's the advice there or how... how how do herd owners, how do the department deal with that? So I suppose they all have to be kind of looked at a, at an individual level because, you know, all the herds are different. Um, the, you know, the, you know, beef herds, dairy herds, different sizes, different uh, ways of farming them. But in a lot of those cases where you have this ongoing cycle of infection, it's what we call residual infection. Um, so it's become embedded in the herd. You can have an older cow there doesn't necessarily have to be an older cow but they tend to be older and what they have is they they have the infection they probably have multiple lesions but outwardly they're not showing any signs of it but it is having an impact on their immune system and it's reducing their capacity to respond to the test but these animals can be highly infectious so they're passing they're passing the the the, the, the annual herd test or they're passing you know, these uh, reactor retests, they're actually, that animal is passing the test, but they can be shedding, you know, infectious fomites and uh, infectious respiratory droplets and aerosols that have been taken in and infecting other animals and they're responding to the test. So that's that's how you get into that cycle of just test after test after test. So that's where you have to then think about, do we need to remove all the animals here? And if you get into scenarios where like 30% of the herd is infected, you know, that has to become a consideration and that goes up into 50%. So, you know, that's a conversation that the veterinary inspector would be having with the herd owner to to talk about that and, you know, to try and break that cycle of infection. Mm, so really what you're saying there, the, the point there is you try, more than likely there's an animal there in the background that that is infected, is spreading the disease, but isn't responding to the to the test so first and foremost you try to identify that animal david i suppose is the and and that's it i mean it's it's like we said before you, you try and identify the disease and then confine the disease but if you have an animal there that is um that is just that's not responding to the test and you're not picking right and she's passing the blood test then you know that makes it much harder to to, to root it out and i mean there's there's other sources um 
but you know it's unlikely in that ongoing cycle that the other sources are the cause it's more than likely that it's the residual infection that you're just not able to find that animal or animals that are spreading the disease amongst the healthier animals from a wildlife perspective david in terms of what's happening with regards wildlife management the current strategy around that so i guess maybe when we talk about the wildlife we might maybe go back to the beginning um so there was a lot of work done in the 80s and 90s that showed that there there was uh, irrefutable evidence that uh, there was a link between badgers and the spread of uh, bovine tb now the, the badger is an unusual animal in ireland because so they're important in their ecosystem so the idea like we began culling badgers but the idea of continually continuing to cull them ad infinitum it's it's not really sustainable and particularly in this context when everybody talks about diversity uh, biodiversity and that so it's not a sustainable approach to continue to keep culling an animal that's vital to your ecosystem so there was a lot of work done uh, using uh, the bcg vaccination on badgers and there was uh, that was carried out in areas where they Basically, when they end, they vaccinated badgers and they monitored those versus other areas where they were culling. Uh, so the outcome of that was that they found that vaccinating the badgers was uh, was as effective or no less worse than culling badgers. So in 2019, they rolled out a badger vaccination program. And in the first year, I think they vaccinated about 1900 badgers and just 2023, the year just gone, we would have captured about nine and a half thousand badgers um to be vaccinated in the vaccine areas so we still have vaccination and cull uh running side by side because in in order to prepare an area for vaccination it needs to you have to give the vaccine a chance to work so what you need to have is you need to have low levels of bovine tb and you need to have a reduced uh badger density in the area that you're going to vaccinate in so you go in you vaccinate the badgers so you're protecting them then if they're exposed to bovine TB, either by cattle or by other badgers, and then prevent them from spreading uh, the TB back to cattle. And I suppose at the very start, you mentioned there, David, a 5% incidence rate that's growing year on year. Ireland's TB eradication scheme started in 1954, and a TB forum was set up in 2018, and a new eradication strategy was launched in 2021. Looking at the countries abroad, and they've eradicated TB. After 70 years on, are we any further along eradicating TB? But as far as I know, I think there's only two countries have eradicated it. I think that's Japan and Australia. Um, now, if you in the period, let's say, preceding the expansion of the dairy herd, we were around 3.7 herd incidents, and it was on a downward trajectory. Um, I suppose the expansion of the dairy herd has probably acted as a, a kind of a disruptor here. Uh, you had a lot of movement of animals all around the country as people either expanded herds or you had guys getting into uh, dairying for the first time. So um, you had a lot of movement of animals. And I, I think probably the increases that we're seeing now, the genesis of that was probably the expansion of the herd. So I mentioned earlier in the podcast that we had felt the background levels of the disease were rising and that our surveillance uh, our surveillance is just catching up with it now so unfortunately at the moment where they're going in the wrong way I think I'd be optimistic that maybe we might be about to turn a corner on it um, but you know I suppose the other way to look at it is that 95% of the herds are not locked up and that that is a positive thing and I spoke as well about the value of the TB test that uh, we, you know, something that we have to do, and we have to have a control program in place. Thanks very much, David. Thank you. That's it for this week's episode of the Dairy Edge podcast, and my thanks to Catherine Egan and David Quinn for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. For more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm James Dunn and join us next time for your Dairy Edge.